liberal interventionism and the human lose their place within the planned society of technique and progress. To Alul, as progress took over, there was the promise of an escape from poverty for people and a promised life of luxury, where man, who would eventually be replaced by the machines, would have all the time for ample pleasure and play. Man is still spellbound by progress despite all its setbacks. To Alul, man is preoccupied with a myth of progress. Progress brings man back to a supernatural world, a sacred delirium. For as we previously said, technique is nothing short of sacred, leading man to his own further enslavement, tempted by the ideal promises of a leisureful and carefree life. Like Faust's deal with Mephistopheles, we must ask, what price do we have to pay for the power brought on by progress? Currently, there is no other way of technically progressing if the state cannot be connected to the economic mechanism itself. Technique requires centralized organization. To Alul, the idea of maintaining technique while living in a decentralized system is purely utopian. The state acts as the organ of centralization in a planned system, having no choice but to play its part, interfering when necessary for the purposes of planning. We can already see how different this is from Land's own ideals. To Alul, technical progress is not possible without the intervention of the state, of course remembering that it still cannot control technique itself, as technique seemingly operates on its own. As such, the state and the economy tend to become aspects of the same phenomenon. To quote Alul, we are witnessing the birth of a new organism, the technical state, which makes economic life more secure in proportion as it becomes more technical. This double relation enhances with time, hindering humanitarianism as people no longer play an important role in the system itself. Politics and economics forms a synthesis, and like a vanishing mediator, politics disappears while economics is forced into a state of technical submission. Social equality and socialism become myths due to the emergence of an aristocracy of technicians. The proletariat doesn't disappear, but is only extended onwards into the future. Socialism can only exist in little fragmented forms. It will not exist systemically. Owning the modes of production in the Marxist sense is meaningless. Anarchistic tendencies likewise die under order and organization. If capitalism is to be destroyed, technique itself becomes the most important factor in its destruction. The question is, who can integrate and further develop technical progress itself? No economy founded on technique can be a liberal economy, as technique is opposed to liberalism since liberalism is not technique itself. Organization, in other words, acts as the antithesis to the liberal mind as well as free enterprise. As Alul states, liberalism permitted the development of its executioner. While liberalism's end is monetary profit, technique's only end, remember, is efficiency and rationality. In a planned economy, however, profit takes a backseat to technical efficiency. Furthermore, a company who advances more in technique will outcompete other companies and eliminate them, thus further destroying liberalism itself. It is always technique we see that heads towards the top. The more technique advances, the more constrained the liberalism becomes. Furthermore, as technique adapts, so do too the economic laws it helps structure. It is almost a living organism in this sense, and all must adapt accordingly. All things change. As such, the values and ideologies of old ways are cast out for new ones to take over. Technique breaks down barriers, and as such gives rise to a mass economy. Mass simply meaning opposed to community, where the economy is taken as a whole in the form of macroeconomics, i.e. something on a global scale. After all, if we're breaking down borders, all becomes global, leading towards universalism and later intercontinental economies, which lead to a mass economy. Alul cites Sartre's statement, statistics can never be dialectics, which is true, since statistics is univocal, focusing solely on numerical aspects and is thus anti-dialectical. The movement of masses are the same, univocal and anti-dialectical and everyone becomes a mass man, unable to escape. In the same way that the Logos is replaced by Nomos, statistics hold sway over dialectics. 
Since men are enslaved to such mechanisms, they can't exert any general influence on it. And without people being able to impact things with their opinions, the economic technique proves to lead to an anti-democratic economy. To quote Alul, what technique wins, democracy loses. Who can then intervene over technique? Well, certainly not the politicians that people vote for. The economy is far too technical now for the common man to any longer intervene. The worker is not meant to enhance his freedom, but merely improve upon technique. The public never demanded television, for example. Technical progress created it, and it was then imposed upon the public. Similarly, any standardization comes from technique itself, which is, by its nature, anti-democratic. Everything must work to the efficiency of the planned economy at this point, and there is no time for the uninformed outside opinions of common people. Man must simply conform and assimilate to these authoritarian norms and modes of operation. It is this authoritarian method that is needed to keep the technical economy developing onward. All, including democracy, is constrained by this economic necessity, turning all that was natural into its artificial opposite. All is obligatorily incorporated so as to serve. Down the path of technique comes the loss of all liberty. The economic man is one who conforms to the planned economy, and the human is changing in an act of becoming because of this, losing his humanity more and more. The whole process started back in the 19th century, as we've discussed, by the bourgeoisie, where all revolved around making money, and where thanks to Marx, both the bourgeoisie and proletariat are now no longer men, but just machines for production and consumption purposes. To quote Alul, and propaganda reduced to advertising relates happiness and a meaningful life to consumption. He who has money is the slave of the money he has. He who has it not is the slave of a mad desire to get it. To Alul, Marx was a faithful representative of bourgeoisie thought, whereas Proudhon and Bakunin had placed spiritual forces to rival economic order. Again, to quote Alul, Marx made a success of the terrible confiscation. The spiritual resources released from oppression were to be put at the service of the oppressor, not indeed the bourgeois oppressor, but the economic one. Indeed, technique has been successful at shaping and sculpting, through dehumanization, the economic man it needed. Where man is capital itself, unified only by a production-consumption complex, integrated into the technical matrix, the more his social needs are met by statistics. The man is an actor upon the stage of the technical plan, and he must play his part. And all his needs will be modified so that he can play this part. Man is no longer a slave to the machine. He has since become one, attaining the marvelous freedom of unconsciousness, acting as but an unresponsible object, but a function of economic technique itself.